Let me start by uh, telling you a story that doesn't reflect very well on me. Um, I once wrote an article for a, a, a glossy magazine um, urging tourists to go to a, a Congolese town called Bukavu. I don't know if you know the place. It's a fantastic place. It's got lovely weather, lakeside views, wonderful sort of um, bougainvillea blossoms which sort of frame your view out of your hotel room, hot nightlife opportunities to go gorilla watching, which is great fun. You know, you go out into the, the jungle with them. Um, a bunch of guides and uh, you, you trek for a very long time and then eventually you, you find a gorilla and then you stand still and uh, the male gorilla who tends to be quite possessive about his harem of, of female gorillas and thinks mistakenly in fact that you might be um, trying to pinch some of his, uh, his mates um, will, will charge you and this is absolutely terrifying but you have a guard who puts his, uh, sorry, guide who puts his hands on your shoulders and stops you from running away which um, is what you have to do and you then act submissive to the gorillas and they don't kill you. Anyway so what I'm saying is this is an absolutely fantastic place to go on holiday but just as my article was about to go to press the town was overrun by gun-toting rebels so, um, in a bit of a panic, I uh, contacted the, uh, the editor in Los Angeles and I said, um, you know, is it too late to change a few things um, about the article? Um, and he said, well, you've got, you've got a few minutes, so uh, get on with it. So, I added some words to the effect that before going to Bukavu, you might want to um, wait until the dust had settled and the shooting had stopped. Um, and uh, there, was a, there was an illustration with the uh, article that um, had a picture of Lake Kivu, the, uh, the, the lake there, and the, uh, the caption underneath it was Lake Kivu, as calm as a Zen garden. Um, I suggested adding the words, except during battles. <laughs> My point is that um, one must approach a subject as vast and unpredictable um, as sub-Saharan Africa with a measure of modesty with an understanding that uh, there's no way one person can know everything, there's no way we can know what the next day is going to throw up, um, and that one has to understand the limits of one's own knowledge about it. Nonetheless, I do think there are some generalizations that one can make. One of these is that Africa is much poorer than it should be. Roughly 40% of the people south of the Sahara subsist on a dollar a day or less. Now, how poor is that? It's quite hard for a, 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 an American audience to understand what that means. Um, I mean, the, the concept of hunger, for example. I mean, I, I read in American newspapers about rising hunger in the United States, and by which they mean that uh, some charities having taken in more donations or giving out more free food, which people accept, which is not at all the same thing as, 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 as rising hunger. I've been into a, a number of soup kitchens in the United States, and it is very striking to me that the people being fed there are all considerably larger than I am. Um, this is a good thing. It's wonderful that, that you live in a, a, a very prosperous country. But w when we're talking about sort of American poverty, which is whatever it is, $16,000 a year for a family of four, this is a completely different concept from African poverty. It's not, it's, it's, we're just not talking about the same thing. Um, I, I'll tell you an anecdote which illustrates, I think, the, uh, the difference between uh, a rich country like America and the poorest places on earth. I, I once wrote an article trying to compare the lives of two people who made the same cash income each year. One of them was the, the poorest guy I could find in America. I sort of went out into Appalachia and asked around um, the local charity workers to see if they could point me in the direction of somebody who was really, really down on his luck and not, not doing so well. And eventually, through a chain of contacts, I was introduced to uh, a man called Enos Banks, and he was this, this guy, I guess he was in his, his 50s or something, and he, he, he lived in a, a trailer in a hollow um, with, you know, various, about half a dozen cars in various states of disrepair up on blocks outside it and a, a pile of crushed Pepsi cans um, on his doorstep. And uh, he... Uh, he made by he he got by on I think it was supplemental security income so welfare of a sort of about five hundred dollars a month, and you know he he was 
reasonably resourceful man and he would he would do quite a lot of clever things to get by you know when the he's very clever with his hands so when the the price of gas surged he uh, he grafted a chainsaw engine onto um a, a a a bicycle and made himself a sort of moped which saved gas and he also had a he, he turned his rifle into a walking stick because he'd, he'd had a problem with his his foot and he'd fixed a little plastic cap onto the the barrel so that it wouldn't get clogged with dirt when he was using it as a as a crutch um and uh he, he figured that he could sort of whip the cap off if someone came for his pain medication and then he'd be able to shoot them plumb between the eyes as he put it um Anyway, this, this, this fine gentleman I met had, um, I contrasted him with uh, a man in Congo who had exactly the same, uh, roughly the same cash income each month, about five or $600. Now, he was the uh, chief surgeon at the largest hospital in the country. His name was Mbwebwe Kabamba. And you, you might think that with the difference in the cost of living between the two countries that the, uh, the Congolese man would be better off. But the... Uh, the Congolese doctor on $600 a month um, was supporting an extended family of 12 people, um, whereas uh, Mr. Banks in Kentucky, his three adult children all drew their own benefits, um, and he'd separated from his wife so that they could draw benefits separately, and she lived in the trailer next door to him. Um, Dr. Kabamba had uh, no running water in his house, electricity maybe twice a week, um, and his family eats meat twice a month. Now, when I tell Africans that uh, poor people, quote, poor people in America eat meat more, than, more meat than rich people do, they simply don't believe me. They don't believe that this is possible, but it is. So what I'm saying is that um, third world poverty, as we no longer call it, is a completely different thing. Many Africans are very poor. Um, and more worryingly in Africa, between 1975 and 1995, Africa was the only continent that actually grew poorer, despite the explosion of trade and technology, which had been raising living standards all around the world. Now, this, this is a staggering failure. To, I mean, knowledge is cumulative. You don't have to reinvent the, the joint stock company or the internal combustion engine. Um, people countries ought to get richer each year because knowledge is cumulative. For a whole continent to grow significantly poorer over an extended period of time is, is like an individual doing the same job for 20 years and actually getting worse at it. Now, such people do exist. Um, but, you know, for, 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 for several hundreds of millions of people to be doing it collectively is extraordinary. So, so this question sort of nagged at me from, from the first time I started reporting on Africa. Why? You know, how did this come to be? It's extraordinary. Um, and what can Africans do about it? Now, those are the two main questions I've tried to address in the shackled continent. Um, so what's the answer? Well, one can rattle off a long list of uh, plausible culprits for Africa's poverty. There's the legacy of colonialism, present-day agricultural subsidies in the West, the disadvantages of geography and climate. Africa includes many countries that are too small to register on a multinational investor's radar screen, many landlocked countries, and many countries where uh, energy-sapping tropical diseases are endemic. Um, Jeff Sachs, the uh, American economist, estimates that um, malaria, just this one disease, knocks about one percentage point off African growth rates each year. I mean, it's a simple fact that it's very hard to work when you're shivering with fever. Now, all these, all these factors are important, but I would argue that the most important break, the most important obstacle to African growth over the years has been the uh, dismal quality of African governance. Let me uh, give you a couple of examples of what I mean by that. I once um, hitched a ride on a beer truck in Cameroon. The idea was to uh, accompany the delivery guy and his mate as we were moving 30,000 bottles of Guinness from uh, the port city of Douala to uh, a, a, a little town deep in the rainforest. It was a short journey, not very far at all. Um, it's about 500 kilometers, I think. Um, so uh, about the same distances from here to Hartford, Connecticut. Our rather optimistic schedule um, suggested that it was going to take us three quarters of a day. But in fact, it took four days. The roads were unpaved. 
Now, that didn't matter so long as it didn't rain, but we were in a rainforest. So it rained every day very hard, turning the, the, the roads into a sort of mucky swamp that we got stuck in a number of times. There was uh, an ill-maintained Ill bridge at one point. I think somebody had been embezzling the, uh, the budget for maintaining it uh, that, that collapsed, so we had to take a, a, a detour. But the main problem was that we were stopped at police roadblocks 47 times. I don't know how familiar you are with uh, Central African roadblocks, but uh, we'd meet a, a sort of oil drum uh, in the middle of the road with maybe some barbed wire or a sort of upturned plank with nails sticking up. And the truck would come to a stop and the policeman would get out and he'd start, you know, checking the axles and the tail lights and going through our paperwork page by page to see if maybe there was something we'd done wrong um, that he could then stop us for so that maybe we'd pay him to let us go. And some of the policemen would sort of rub their enormous fat stomachs as they approached us just to signal that they were hungry. Um, and uh, it was a source of considerable delay. There was one um, there was one place I recall where we were stopped for three and a half hours and there were seven policemen haggling over how much the bribe ought to be and then there was three of us in the truck. So I calculated that was 35 man hours wasted, which is roughly one French working week. <laughs> and that's for a bribe of about $10 they were asking from us. And the, the clearest explanation I got as to why the police in Cameroon treat people this way came from the gendarme at uh, roadblock number 31. Now, he had made up a rule about carrying passengers in beer trucks, which he said was forbidden. Um, and obviously, we were breaking it. And um, I, I put it to him. I said, look, this, this rule about carrying passengers in beer trucks, you just made it up, right? And uh, he looked at me, and he tapped his gun, his holster by his side. And he said, do you have a gun? And I said, well, no, I'm, I'm English. Um, and he said, well, I have a gun, so I know the rules. And I thought that was a very pithy explanation of what, what, to my mind, is Africa's central problem. It's that too often the men with the guns make the rules. The people who have power use it to prey on the, the citizenry, to extract rents from the productive members of society. Now, if anyone ever tells you that corruption doesn't matter, think what it is like being a peasant in Cameroon. Every time you want to get your goods, your crops to market, you have to run a gauntlet of uh, roadblocks where the police will take what your incredibly small profits and they will, they will take most of them. Um, and then think of how much this inflates the costs of everything manufactured you want to buy, whether it's um, antibiotics or axe heads or matches or plastic boxes or anything. I mean, I, I did a little, you know, rough and ready jotting in my notebook of how the prices of things changed as you got further away from the cities where they were made or the ports where they were imported. And just the price of something like a, a, a bottle of beer would be jacked up by about 30% between uh, the capital city and um, a village in the in the rainforest that uh, you might have to walk to. It's a staggering difference. And this is an enormous tax on the people who are least able to pay it. And a completely undemocratic tax because nobody ever voted to say, yes, policemen can rob you at roadblocks. There is another kind of uh, governance problem which shackles Africa. And that's when the rules themselves are the problem. Uh, for a region that's often thought lawless, Africa has a surprising amount of red tape. And consider what it takes just to register a business. Um, we're not talking about listing on a stock exchange here, just you know, registering a business uh, so that it's formal and legal for sort of tax and statistical purposes. Um, it's the, the process by which a, a, a corner shop becomes legitimate so that you, know, you can borrow money from a bank or something. Now, in rich countries, this process is quick and cheap. In New Zealand, it takes one day and costs the equivalent of 0.4% of the GDP per head there. In Congo, by contrast, it takes 149 days and costs 391% of the average income per head. So if you're a Congolese entrepreneur and you don't have a rich daddy, you can't start a formal legal business. That means you can't borrow money from a bank, and that means you stay small. Red tape fosters corruption. When the rules are onerous, people will pay bribes to be excused from obeying them. 
And that gives bureaucrats a perverse incentive because they suddenly realize that the worse they do their job, the more money they're going to get offered to stop. And so they do their job with a spirit of aggressive obstructionism, trying to prevent people from doing things that create value, trying to prevent people from, from starting businesses or doing anything so they can capture more bribes for getting out of the way. The, the World Bank did a very interesting um, new report this year um, from their, their African Development Indicators annual that they come up with every year. And they talked to the problem of what they call um, silent corruption. Now, this is not the, the, the high-profile stuff where, you know, a cabinet minister takes millions of dollars of bribes as a kickback on an arms deal. It's something much smaller but more common and therefore probably more harmful. Mostly it's about when people accept public money to do a job, the civil servants, and then don't do it. So an obvious example would be public school teachers who don't show up to work. And this is, this is a very big problem in a lot of countries. I mean, estimates in places like Kenya say that, roughly speaking, a fifth of the teachers are absent every day. And this is not just because they want to spend, um, you know, more time growing food or eking out their income trading. There's actually a perverse incentive at work here where they discover that if they don't teach very well, then during, during school days, then some of the parents will pay them to give private tutoring um, after hours um, because the children haven't learnt enough to get through the exams that they need to get through. Um, and this is, this, is, this is tremendously destructive. You find that for the poorer families who can't afford that, they realise that their kid's not learning anything in school because the teacher's not showing up. So they pull him out of school and send him to go and help in the fields and be useful. And that dooms him to a, a life of subsistence farming, which is not much fun. Another example, you find that staff at public health clinics... Um, it's not just that they, they steal the drugs and sell them on the black market. It's sometimes that they will actually decide not to have the clinic open for very long if you're in a remote area. Um, and the clinic's supposed to be open from 9 till 5 or whatever, and that's what you're being paid for, working for the government. They discover that if they open the clinic for, say, one random 20-minute period during the day, then people will very quickly get the message that you can't get anything from the government clinic. So you have to go to the private clinic next door, which is run by the same person with the drugs he's stolen from the uh, government uh, pipeline. And so the peasants have to pay for things, which in theory, as taxpayers, they've already paid for. Now, you may think this doesn't happen very often, but uh, excluding salaries, the proportion of public money intended to fund health care that is misappropriated varies from roughly 38% in Kenya to an incredible 99% in Chad, according to the World Bank. What happened to the other 1% in Chad, I don't know. A final example of a similar type of thing. A lot of African governments provide subsidies uh, for fertilizer for subsistence farmers so that they can, you know, grow a bit more and eat a bit more. Um, now, the problem is that it's very hard to keep check of what exactly it is that the bureaucrats give to the peasants, saying it's fertilizer. Very often, at the, at the beginning of the chain, what you have is fertilizer, and by the time it gets to the peasants, uh, it's maybe sort of 10% fertilizer, and the rest is God knows what. But whatever it is, they're giving this very highly diluted stuff, having sold most of the fertilizer on the black market. Um, and so they're, they're giving them fertilizer which doesn't work. And the peasants use it, and they say, sod this, this modern technology doesn't work at all. Let's abandon it. And so they stay at the very low level of agricultural productivity that they had before, and their children grow up malnourished. And that means that they grow up stunted both physically and, more importantly, mentally. Malnutrition, when you are a kid, you need food to make your brain grow. It's the hungriest organ in your body. And if you don't give it food, it won't develop. And then you're going to spend your whole life poor. So how did we get here? Now, let me give, let me give you an illustration, a sort of more macro illustration of um, the difference between good and bad governance. I mean, an obvious example, if one leaps away from Africa, um, is to look at sort of countries that have been split, like sort of North and South Korea. And I used to spend, I used to live in South Korea, and I've spent some time in North Korea. And the thing that struck me was that these two countries, which had been culturally identical for 5,000 years, um, 
and which in 1945, at the end of World War II, North Korea was the richer of the two because it was where the Japanese and alienists built all the factories. Um, North Korea was richer than South Korea. Um, now, if you visit the two places, South Korea is the kind of place where manual laborers go on beach holidays in Thailand and generally have a very good time. And North Korea is a place that's so desperately poor that, I mean, who knows, maybe a million people starved to death in the 1990s. We really don't know. There's 200,000 in a gulag. Um, people strip the, the grass off hills to boil it up and eat for, for, for dinner. Um, and... and and that's, that's only the beginning of, of, of how big the difference is between the sort of two political systems. It's not just about material unhappiness. It's about um, spiritual unhappiness as well. The, the freedom of thought and expression that you get in a, in a free society like South Korea is something that just makes people happy. Um, one example, I think, illustrates this very well. I remember doing a story about art in the two Koreas. And I contrasted a standard piece of, of, of political art in South Korea, which is you go into the gallery there, and um, there was a, a silhouette of the then president's face, a chap called Kim Yong-sam, um, uh, done with uh, musical speakers, sort of black speakers on a white wall. And then through the president's face, the uh, installation artist played uh, a series of grunts and sighs and moans. It's the soundtrack of a pornographic movie. And I think he was making some very deep point about how, you know, the media um, distort the way we see reality or something like that. But I mean, you know, well, whatever you think of it as art, it clearly showed that there was a degree of freedom there. Whereas I recall going into the main art gallery in uh, North Korea, and they'd got this, um, you know, socialist realist painter to do um, a picture of a steelworks at twilight, you know, good sort of proletarian art. And then the uh, director of the gallery has said, well, you know what, there's, uh, there's something missing from this painting. Um, and he said, a picture of the dear leader. So they got the artist back and they made him paint a fucking great picture of the dear leader in the foreground, smiling with the steelworks in the background. And, um, you know, the whole of North Korean art works, alas, in that way. But moving back to Africa, let me give you an example from Africa, which is actually quite similar. If you contrast, say, Botswana with Zimbabwe. Now, these two countries, again, they didn't have the same start. Um, at, the, uh, at, at independence, Botswana had nothing. A, a British, rather tactful British colonial officer described it as a worthless piece of territory, whereas Zimbabwe was the second most sophisticated um, and uh, diversified economy south of the Sahara. However, since independence, um, Botswana has been governed uh, sensibly and moderately um, the, and democratically. They found a lot of diamonds under the desert. They didn't waste the money. They've, uh, you know, spent it on sensible things like roads and schools and healthcare. Um, the, uh, the, the, the government is relatively uncorrupt. The former president has been seen doing his own shopping. Um, and as a result of just getting these really basic things right, Botswana has grown faster than almost any other country over the past four decades, from absolutely bare subsistence to a middle income level, about $6,000 per person per year. A success story marred only by a calamitous AIDS epidemic. So since, since, since independence, roughly speaking, Botswana has become 10 times richer, while Zimbabwe, the incomes have fallen by two-thirds. Now, the problem, the difference is leadership. The president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, is, uh, he's a command and control kind of guy, right? I mean, this is a very useful quality in a rebel leader, which is what he was. Um, but it's not quite so useful when you're trying to run an economy. Um, to give you uh, an example, he, 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 he faced a problem. Um, in the uh, late 1990s, which was that an opposition party uh, funded, uh, organized by the trade unions and partly funded by um, commercial farmers, most of whom are white, uh, came into existence. And uh, it threatened him at the, at the polls um, because he was not very popular. And um, he saw this as, I mean, he, he kind of feels that he owns the country. So he saw this as a great personal affront. Um, and instead of trying to you know, govern well or something to woo people's votes. He decided to shut down the industry that was funding the opposition party, commercial farming. 
Now, this industry and related businesses accounted for 60% of the economy, so this is not a small thing he was deciding to do. He decided that since the, uh, the white farmers were white, um, that it would be a good thing to stir up a bit of racial animus against them um, and uh, embark on a campaign of what he called land reform. Um, that meant, he said, that he was going to uh, give the agricultural land that the uh, British colonialists stole from the indigenous people back to landless peasants. Um, well, that's what he said he'd do. It's not exactly what happened. The um, last time I, uh, I went to Zimbabwe, I visited a farm which had been given not to landless peasants, but to um, a senior army officer who was a friend of the president's wife. And um, he, this chap had taken over the farm and um, he didn't really know anything about farming. Um, but he, he did know something about violence. He came up with a, a very novel way of uh, raising cash from his, his new property, um, which was that he went around all the huts where the many hundreds of farm workers worked, and he kicked down the door with his men with guns, and he seized from all the farm workers the severance payments which the um, white farmer had given to them as he was being driven off his land. Um, and then he kicked them off as well. The land is now barren. Uh, baboons have eaten what's left of the seed corn. And for miles and miles around, what used to be the bread basket of Africa has turned into a basket case. Um, the people are almost entirely dependent on food aid when Robert Mugabe lets the aid agencies in, which he doesn't always, particularly if you vote for the opposition. And what Mugabe did with land, he's also done with the nation's pension funds um, and much of private business as well. One, one statistic tells the story, you know, when a government runs out of money and it's run by um, an economically illiterate buffoon, what they normally do is start printing money. Um, I've stood at cash machines in Harare and watched with horror as the banknotes come out crisp and fresh and with consecutive serial numbers on them. One statistic tells the story. When Mugabe took over in 1980, uh, one American dollar was worth slightly less than one Zimbabwean dollar. On November the 17th, 2008, one American dollar would have bought you 642 quadrillion Zimbabwe dollars. That is an 18-digit number. That's actually quite hard to um, conceptualize, as we don't normally deal with numbers that big. Um, before long after, after that, there were beggars in the streets using $10 trillion notes to wipe their noses with. And at this point, the government gave up printing money and switched to the South African rand. I could go into the figures for collapsing incomes and life expectancies and mass emigration, but you get the picture. Now, the good thing about bad governance is that it can be changed. It's not like geography. It's not like the weather. You can change it. Um, the snag, of course, is that bad rulers don't like to retire. Let me tell you about the last election in Zimbabwe, um, which took place in 2008. To, to win this election um, with the economy in a mess and, uh, you know, um, Mugabe obviously needed to uh, tilt the playing field slightly. So we start with the, the voters' role, which was stuffed with non-existent and dead people, all of whom voted for the ruling party. Um, then there was the police who were standing there in the polling station so that they could assist um, illiterate voters in where to put their mark on the ballot. And there was a huge mountain of surplus ballot papers, far more than there were eligible voters in Zimbabwe that the government printed, you know, just in case they might come in handy at some point. Um, and then there was the media, the state television and radio showed the great president, the father of the nation, handing out free computers and food in schools, um, while at the same time reporting of the opposition's plans to bring back forced labor and colonialism. Um, the, there, was, there was some independent media in the country, but it was a little bit hampered in doing its job. Um, the independent broadcast media were completely banned, of course. Uh, the main independent newspaper was shut down, its printing presses blown up, and its reporters all arrested, many of them beaten up. Um, and finally, the president made two types of campaign promise. 
Now, there was the type of promise which nobody believed, such as that he said that he would bring back um, prosperity for all. And then there was the kind of promise which everybody believed, where he made it very clear that villages that did not vote for him would suffer serious consequences. President Mugabe had won the trust of the people of Zimbabwe that he really would keep that kind of promise, because in the past he had always done so. I recall covering one election where... Um, talking to just one random guy who used to stuff um, envelopes for the opposition party. And uh, I asked him if, if there'd been any consequences for that, and he said yes. He was kidnapped by uh, men from the, uh, the Central Intelligence Organization who held him down and took a, a bicycle spoke and jabbed it into various soft parts of his anatomy. Um, and uh, he showed me the x-rays from his uh, hospital. He kind of waved them at me like a banner of protest almost. And he said that although he was pretty sure he'd never be able to have children, it was the last thing he was going to do. He was going to vote this bastard out. Well, in 2008, um, before the election, Mugabe had used all these various techniques to stack the process um, in his favor. The amazing thing is he still lost. His mistake was he thought he would be able to carry out massive ballot rigging um, and the vote count centrally without interruption. But what he hadn't bargained for was that the opposition party had sent um, observers to every polling station who were counting what people actually said they were voting for at the place. And the opposition party then also collated their results centrally. And the ruling party thought they'd be able to stop the opposition party from doing this because the opposition party had set up a dummy campaign headquarters by booking in under their own name in the uh, the main hotel in town and putting a load of computers there and having you know some sort of young men sit there as if they were um, counting numbers and then on polling day of course the uh, the central intelligence people came charging in arrested everyone grabbed all the computers and found out it was a completely dummy operation and the real opposition party vote counting operation was taking place in a cellar somewhere they didn't know about so the opposition party were able to come out with an exact vote count, um, you know, despite all the sort of dead people voting and so on, um, on the day. And so Mugabe was not able to claim that he'd won the election. However, he did, through cheating, keep his opposition, the opposition leader, Morgan Changarai, to below the 50% of the vote necessary to avoid a runoff. So there was a second round of voting, and this time Mugabe took no chances. He arrested every opposition activist he could get hold of. He had them brutally tortured. He sent his men into rural areas um, to round up the people who had voted the wrong way and herd them into re-education camps where they were made to stay up all night singing revolutionary songs while the, the old women were raped and the young women were also raped. Um, and they seared people's bodies with molten plastic and told them, listen, if you vote the wrong way the next time, um, we're going to kill you. So, eventually, Morgan Changarai, the opposition leader, just pulled out of the election. He said he couldn't expect his people to get killed. So Mugabe won with 85% of the vote. Now, I tell this story at some length, not because Zimbabwe is typical of Africa. Thank God it isn't, and it's becoming less so every year. I tell it because it's typical of the old Africa, the one that hopefully we're seeing the back of, and also because it, it illustrates, I think, so clearly my two central messages. Um, one is that in the struggle against poverty, governance matters most of all. And the other is that democracy is the least bad system for improving governance. And the epilogue in Zimbabwe is not quite as bad as you would expect. Mugabe is still in charge, but after immense pressure from his neighbors, he has invited the opposition into a power-sharing government, and things have gotten slightly less bad. There is more improvement in the rest of Africa. But before we get to that, let's step back um, and ask, how did Africa get so many authoritarian governments in the first place? Let me tell you another story. I went to watch a, a traditional court in operation, uh, a court of the Bafokeng tribe in South Africa. Um, that's, I don't know if any of you guys were watching the World Cup. The uh, USA versus Ghana was played at the Royal Bafokeng Stadium. That's the place. Anyway, they, they say it's in, they always say that the World Cup, that, 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 the match is being played in the town of Rustenburg. It's actually in a town called Fucking, but they don't say that for some reason. Um, anyway, so, so I was watching this traditional court in operation, 
Um, and the, the chief judge there told me they tried a case that day, and it was um, where a woman claimed that her neighbor had used foul language at her, and they called a witness, and they, they found out that it wasn't true, so they dismissed the case. It lasted about 15 minutes. These courts sometimes meet under trees. They deal with petty theft, marital problems, and antisocial behavior. Under South African law, they can hand down fines, but not whippings or jail terms. Serious crimes like rape and murder have to be tried in the formal justice system under the, the written law. Now, traditional courts have several advantages. A Mofokeng older explained to me, he said, it's better than going to town, queuing for ages, giving a lawyer money you don't have. It's quicker, it's cheaper, it's less confrontational. It's about trying to solve quarrels. Um, you know, if a man is having an affair, the court, the traditional court will explain to him that he's, he's, he's hurting his family and try to persuade him to stop. Customary law, unwritten law, is somewhat arbitrary, as it, it depends on unwritten rules and, and the whim of an unelected chief. But although the rules are unwritten, people are familiar with them and respect them. A traditional African chief may be unelected, but he's not wholly unaccountable. He lives in the same village as the people he, he rules, and he hears their complaints. If he rules badly, he can be deposed, usually without bloodshed. But what traditional law cannot do is cope with the complexities of a modern society. You can't um, regulate telecoms by fiat or have an unwritten banking code. And what works for simple local matters doesn't work for large nation states. And this brings us to Africa's greatest problem. Um, before the European colonists arrived, it was divided into several thousand kingdoms and chieftaincies whose systems of government had evolved naturally over hundreds of years. But by the time the Europeans left, they'd squeezed the whole lot into a few dozen nation states whose borders cut some tribes in half and lumped others together with neighbors they didn't necessarily like much. And onto this artificial structure was grafted systems of government that mimicked European models. And parliamentary democracy is a fine system, but it was alien to Africa. A bureaucratic state on the European model can function only if there are educated people to run it. But at independence in Tanzania, for example, there were only 16 university graduates. So Africa's first experiments with democracy didn't last long. Um, between 1960 and 1979, a total of 59 African rulers were toppled or assassinated. Only three retired peacefully, and not one was voted out of office. Before long, most African countries had, had leaders who ruled as arbitrarily as traditional leaders, but who were far less accountable because they were far more remote from their people. A peasant could walk up to his chief's hut and ask him questions, but getting to talk to the president in his walled palace is much harder. Now, during the Cold War, some of Africa's rulers called themselves socialists, some called themselves capitalists, but what, what they all, all had in common with each other was they were statists. They concentrated as much power as they could in themselves, in the presidency, and they used it to enrich themselves and their supporters. That meant that the cleverest people either emigrated or went into politics and devoted their, their, their energies and their talents to um, preying on their fellow, their fellow citizens. Um, if you were in power, generally you'd get rich and your kinfolk would get jobs in the civil service. So politics became a zero-sum game. If you lost power, you were in trouble. Of the 107 African leaders overthrown between 1960 and 2003, two-thirds were either killed, jailed, or driven into exile. This combination of risks and rewards gave African leaders a compelling reason to cling to power. So they did all the things that Robert Mugabe did, gagged the press, banned dissent, and turned the security services into their personal militia. Rule by big men rather than by the law has been a disaster for Africa, but it does have a cure. That cure is democracy. The, I mentioned before that uh, in the 1960s and 70s, not one African ruler was peacefully voted out of office. Now, in the 1980s, there was one who was peacefully voted out of office, if you count Mauritius as part of Africa. But in the 1990s, suddenly, because the Cold War was no longer there and you no longer had superpowers propping up despots, the pace accelerated dramatically. There were 12 rulers peacefully voted out of office in the 1990s, and that pace has been maintained since then. I think this is a terrific reason for optimism. Another reason for optimism about Africa is that there are fewer wars than there used to be. 
Angola, Sierra Leone, and Liberia have all stopped shooting. The genocide in Darfur has subsidized, uh, sorry, has subsided. I'm somewhat worried that Sudan, um, the southern part of it, is probably going to secede next year, and that may well lead to a war, and Somalia and Congo are still in a terrible state. Nonetheless, things aren't quite as bad as they were in the early 90s. Elections in Africa are not always free and fair. There was an election in Burundi yesterday, for example, with only one presidential candidate. But most of the time, voting offers at least a chance of change, a chance of improvement. This is going to come incrementally. It's going to require a lot of willpower and patience. Um, in Congo, for example, according to Paul Collier, the author of the excellent book, uh, The Bottom Billion, um, it'll take about 50 years of peace and growth just to get back to the level of African income, of average income that the country enjoyed in 1960. But we have seen solid progress in the past decade. The new, more democratic governments that we've seen have started to get some of the basics right. Property rights are more secure than they used to be. Most African countries have opened up to trade and investment. Um, sound fiscal and monetary policies are actually becoming quite popular. Galloping inflation, hyperinflation used to be the norm. Um, now it's rare. Growth has accelerated, um, averaging about 5% in the past decade. Um, before the current recession began. Now, that's not stellar. It doesn't bear any comparison to India or China, but it's miles better than the stagnation that has gripped Africa for most of my lifetime. And small changes, if compounded over time, can quite quickly become big changes. Measured in, in current dollars, the average income south of the Sahara nearly doubled between 2000 and 2007. Okay, about a third of that growth came from natural resources. I mean, commodity prices for things like oil have surged in the past decade, and countries such as Equatorial Guinea and Angola have received huge unearned windfalls that could just as easily disappear. But that's not the whole story. The World Bank identifies 18 resource-poor African countries that have managed solid growth of 4% or more um, over the past decade or so. Again, that's not stellar, and population growth is about 2.5%, but still, it's a whole lot better than nothing. Now, last year, interestingly, uh, President uh, Barack Obama went to Ghana. Of all the 48 countries that he could have chosen in Africa, he, he chose to visit Ghana for one reason, which was that it, Ghana is a very good example of how when you make the transition from dictatorship to democracy, things tend to get better. Um, it's been through a lot since independence in 1957, Ghana. It was, um, at one point, it was so badly ruled that uh, Ghanaian workers would actually flee into Nigeria to seek better wages because they had a series of dictators who imposed the most preposterous rules, setting prices for what you could uh, sell your produce for in the marketplace and arresting and beating market women who tried to sell things for what they actually cost rather than what the dictator imagined they ought to cost. But the country hasn't had a coup since 1981, and since 1992 there have been tentative and rather successful free market reforms. Uh, in 2008, there was even a peaceful transfer of power from one party to another, despite a vote so close that the ruling party could easily have rigged it. So Ghana is on the mend. And I think it's interesting what President Obama, whose man I don't agree with about everything, but um, what he said when he was on the way there, someone asked him, you know, whose fault is it that Africa hasn't developed as much as it could have done? And he said simply, Africans are responsible for Africa. For many years, he said, we've made excuses about corruption and poor governance, that these things were somehow the consequence of neo-colonialism or that the West has been oppressive or, or racism. And then he said, well, I'm not a believer in excuses. Neither am I. I'm an optimist about Africa. I predict that in the end, Africans will succeed in building the modern, prosperous societies that they all say that they want. And they'll do this by breaking away from the cliches of the past, from the notion that somebody else is going to solve their problems for them. Because even in this era of globalization, what happens in Africa, like what happens everywhere else, is determined first and foremost by the people who live there. Now, you'll notice I've not said anything about foreign aid or global warming or uh, South Africa, but these are I'm sure among the many questions that you'll want to ask me. So I will end there and uh, open up for your questions. Thank you.
So, um, gentleman in the black T-shirt, maybe. Okay, it's working. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, another prominent scholar of Africa, George Aidi, speaks about how he's optimistic because the new generation of Africans, he calls the cheated generation, have a totally new worldview and are unwilling to accept the vampiric state behavior that's been the norm for so long. Do you think that uh, we should be optimistic about Africa in part because of maybe some sort of change in culture like Aidi suggests, or like many others suggest, or more just a change in the institutions that the people are participating in? Um, I think the two are interrelated. Um, I mean, you know, culture shapes institutions and institutions shape culture. Um, I think that the, the model of what you know, what, what, what George calls the, the vampire state and what, you know, um, various African leaders have called, you know, the developmental state or the paternal state or whatever. Um, this, I mean, this, this model has so transparently failed in Africa that I think you're seeing um, a, a greater understanding, particularly among young people, that, you know, it, it's worth trying other models. But there is, there is competition, um, you know, there's, 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 there's a marketplace of ideas out there. And um, capitalism still has, in, in, in some Africans' minds, um, overtones of, you know, a neo-colonialist plot. Um, and there are also a lot of people in government who sort of quite like the idea of, you know, the sort of the Chinese model where you have very rapid economic growth while still having authoritarian government. And, you know, they've managed to supply the authoritarian government. You know, the, the uh, rapid growth hasn't really happened in places that are, that are copying this model. Um, I mean, you know, the, the lesson I take from China is that what you've seen there is a great liberalization economically, and that's why it's grown. And it's a shame that, you know, the politics hasn't liberalized to the same extent, although it's, you know, still a hell of a lot better than it was, you know, during the, the Great Leap Forward or the Cultural Revolution. Um, there are a lot of young Africans who've been educated overseas and who observe that um, you know, capitalism isn't particularly. You know, it's not. It's not a Western thing. It's, 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 it's about the absence of coercion. It's about the opportunity uh, for people to get rich in any way they like and to and to live as they please. And and some of them find that very appealing. Some of them don't. Some of them like the idea of, you know, we're all in this together. And um, if someone's got, you know, a little bit more money, all his neighbours should come round and demand some of it. Um, so it's, I think it's quite a sort of slow process, but you do see, um, you know, particularly as people move to cities, um, a process that is much decried by um, environmentalists and so forth, but which is a fantastic force for good because it enables people to get together with other people who have ideas and work more productively and get richer. Um, we're seeing this happening. I mean, I think, you know, the old, the old gods have been proven to have um, feet of clay, and um, a lot of young Africans um, have, have much more sensible ideas than their elders did about the kind of countries that they ought to live in. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a slow process. And, and as you see in Zimbabwe, you can have a large majority of people in favor of change. But if the men with guns are not in favor of it, they can, they can fight a very effective rear guard action to prevent it happening. We have a question from uh, Lana, and she's curious to know your thoughts on Kiva, Opportunity International, and other microfinance organizations. Um, well, without wishing to get into the specifics of, of, of individual organizations, I mean, the, the, um, the, 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 the overall idea, you know, the model of, of, of microfinance is, is one that works very well, often. Um, I've seen... You know, a lot of a lot of programs uh, which which work very well. The difficulty that people are finding is turning it into a commercial venture. Um, I think people are starting to find that you can get actual private sector funds, profit-seeking funds, to make money out of microfinance. But it's very difficult because I mean the administrative costs for very small loans are very high, um, and um, I'm not. I'm not, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that people can get a return on capital putting money into microfinance, but I am convinced that the model works very well if you're lending money to the right people. Um, the, the, there are a couple of models um, for how to do it. There's the Grameen model that, that they use in Bangladesh, which is, I think, typically in, in, in sort of rural 
um, scenarios where you'll have a bunch of women in the village and one <clears throat> The first one gets a loan to, you know, start her little business or whatever. Um, and then when she pays it back, the next person in the circle can get a loan. So it works through, um, instead of trying to do credit checks on people, which is very difficult when they're unbanked, um, you it's social pressure, peer pressure, makes people pay loans back. Now, that works pretty well in, in rural Bangladesh. Um, it doesn't work so well in, for example, urban South Africa, where the peer pressure, you know, society is a bit more atomized and the peer pressure doesn't work. So what they've, what they've tried there that works is the idea that you lend someone a little bit of money to begin with, and if they pay that back, they can get a larger loan, um, and it goes up in quite small increments. Um, and it, sometimes it can be sort of partially automated to cut down on the um, administrative costs, and, and that seems to work for some people. But you know, a, 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 a lot of the you know, access to credit is one of many problems that you have in a poor society. Um, but it's it's certainly one that you can tackle, and that if 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 the person asking the question is interested in getting into that, I would encourage them to do so. Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, that's that's a sort of that's an interesting question that touches on an absolutely huge one. Um, I mean, there's the sort of tribal structures, which are, you know, for any government, they're a useful way for finding out what's going on in an area. If you're coming from, you know, the remote capital to find out what's going on in a, a rural area, you have to ask the local tribal um, authorities because they're the ones who will know. But there's, there's, there's another question which I, I really want to touch on, which is um, the question of tribalism, which is a, I mean, it's a sort of taboo word now, but it's much shorter than, um, I don't know, um, ethnic sympathy and animosity or whatever. But um, there, there, there are, <clears throat> tribes serve an extremely useful function. And, you know, I, I could be talking about, you know, the Bafa Keng tribe, or I could be talking about the English or the Lebanese or whatever. Groups, um, groups that cohere for reasons of sort of you know ethnic or something like that, uh, you know people who feel that they that they are part of a group. Um, it's a very useful way of transmitting trust. It's a very useful way of you know finding out what's going on, talking to people, networking, um, and 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 it's useful in 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 many circumstances. I mean, you find that the sort of networks of traders who come from the same tribe, whether they're sort of Lebanese or Jews or Mormons or whatever, um, are able to communicate with each other and able to make sort of a long distance phone call to someone and know that you can make a deal um, with someone because they're a cousin of a cousin of a cousin. Um, and it's 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 a it's an extension, if you like, of the the sense of affinity that people have with their own families. And it's a very efficient structure for a lot of voluntary transactions. It is, however, a very dangerous um, thing. The affinity that people feel for their tribe can quite easily tip into hostility towards other tribes. And this becomes um, extremely problematic when governments decide or politicians decide that they're going to manipulate this. And you find in a lot of uh, circumstances, if you have um, a hideously corrupt ruler somewhere, it doesn't have to be in Africa, but it's a huge problem in Africa, and they fear that they're about to, someone's, someone's pointing out that they've been stealing all the money from the sort of health fund or the oil fund. They find it's a tremendously useful way of changing the subject is to say, Aha, the tribe next door um, are plotting to um, steal our cattle or um, take too many civil service jobs. And then before you know it, you have a, a massive amount of, um, you know, you, you can have considerable bloodletting. Um, and in, in some countries, you will have, I mean, like in, in, in Nigeria, for example, um, many of the, some, some of the northern governors in Nigeria who feared that a Christian president in the 1990s was about to investigate them for corruption, of which they were extremely guilty, um, they said, hey, let's embrace Sharia law. Um, and then they, they were able to portray any potential attack on them as an attack on the Quran. And so they were able to carry on embezzling and whoring and drinking and doing all the things that they were doing before, um, completely immune from uh, anything 
uh, any, any, any prosecution by the central government because the central government knew that it would be touching a tinderbox if it went after them. And as a side product of this, you had hundreds and hundreds of people killed in intercommunal um, riots. Um, and, you know, this is, this is a very big problem. Um, and, uh, you know, the, to my mind, the best um, solution to it uh, would be complete separation of tribe and state in the same way that religion and state are separated here. And all the um, mechanisms that so many governments have, and this is not just sort of tribes in Africa, but it's also castes in India and racial groups in the United States, that the, the government should not have any, any quotas, any um, preferences in contracting, um, any sort of um, any rules that recognize the existence of these things at all. I think that's the only way of keeping um, tribal transactions voluntary. I don't know if that helps. Gentleman in the middle. I sort of have a two-part question. Uh, one being, do you think that we could see the rise of customary and or tribal law evolve with, you know, you know, just if trade and globalization to like sort of overshadow the, the bureaucracy and all that, and how would you react to, uh, like in the Lebanese government, where they have a, a confessional system, in that they recognize each ethnic or and or religious group. Mm -hmm. not, not, not that I'm saying it works, but it seems to mitigate some of the pressures. Okay. Um. I'm not hugely familiar with Lebanese internal politics. I know that the excuse that's always given for why you have to divide, um, you know, the country into groups and give rights to groups rather than individuals is because that will prevent civil war and violence. That's the reason, you know, given in South Africa, for example, for why you um, have to order the civil service to allocate jobs by race, you know, 75% black, sort of, you know, 11% white, et cetera. Um, and, but I, I think, you know, if, 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 if you're handing out jobs on the basis of skin color rather than ability, that's not exactly likely to foster excellence in the execution of the job. Because, um, you know, it's completely irrelevant to whether you can do the job or not. Uh, so I think it's a very harmful thing. Um, Sorry, in, in, in terms of uh, will, will, tri I mean, will tribal, will, will customary law um, supersede written law? No. I mean, written law has certain capabilities. It can deal with complexity um, very well. But you are finding in the, in the era of globalization that the influence of ethnic networks around the world has, has come on by leaps and bounds. Um, you have... Uh, I mean, for example, the whatever it is, 50 million overseas Chinese who previously, you know, the, their, their ethnic links used to link them back to this sort of moribund, depressed, communist, um, stagnant autocracy. And now they find that their links actually lead back to one of the most dynamic parts of the world economy, which means that they're a bridge between, you know, China and the West and the West and China, and they're a conduit for ideas and trading contacts between China and every other country in the world. And that, you know, that's, that's sort of tremendous. They're outside, you know, as a group, they're, out, they're not under one particular written legal code, but they do operate. I mean, when you're doing business with people in, in your same group, there's a, there's a, a privilege that comes of knowing that you can ring up a cousin somewhere and say, um, you know, word of mouth deal, I need to order, you know, X million widgets because I see an opportunity right here, right now. You know, we need to order a load of Vuvuzelas or something to sell in, 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 in South Africa. And you can ring up a guy and know that he will um, fulfill that order and he will trust you to pay him because you're, you're you know, within the same group, you're sort of friends of a friend. And if if you were to cheat someone, then the the knowledge that you were a cheater would go around very quickly and you would be shut out of it. So there are, there are sort of informal networks that are very helpful in, particularly in cross-border transactions. So perhaps in that sense, I think, I think they complement the written laws because there's no global written law, um, you know, thank God, because you need competition between different states. Otherwise, you know, it would all be run by bureaucrats. But, but they do complement each other, and they're something that we should pay attention to. Gentleman in the pink tie. It's so rare to see a student wearing a tie, you know, and it's like, <laughs> I never wore one when I was a tie. You mentioned southern Sudan might secede. How compatible do you think secession is with democracy? Oh, God. 
Um, uh, well, look, I mean, you know, it's in, in one sense very compatible that people of southern Sudan do not wish to be yoked to northern Sudan because northern Sudan is run by the people who've been enslaving them for the past half century and bombing their villages and, you know, um, various other unpleasant things. So, you know, the people of southern Sudan do not wish to be part of the same country. Um, on the other hand, uh, when they break off, I mean, there's two questions. Will, will the north let them break off peacefully? I don't know. Possibly not. They'd be taking roughly speaking we would guess about two thirds of the oil that will be an issue um, the, and the other thing is will they, will they get on with each other I mean you know southern Sudan is not um, homogenous there's been sort of incredibly nasty infighting between the various tribal factions down there and if, if there's suddenly a new state and everything's up for grabs and the question of you know who gets to um, grab the oil revenue comes up I think people could well fight over that I think it's a very worrying situation yes gentleman in the middle Um, you mentioned uh, the Chinese model and the uh, African governments that have failed to implement the economic growth side. But what do you think about the Chinese sort of exporting the economic growth in terms of their industrial sort of foreign aid things they're doing, I guess, in, you know, some of the African countries now? I know that's sort of a concern to the international community because of competition. But yeah, um, well, Chinese aid to Africa I mean, or Chinese um Influence in Africa is, is very big, and it's gotten much bigger um, in the past decade. Um, how their aid programs work is very hard to say, because they don't really publish, you know, very detailed or indeed almost any information at all about it. Um, a lot of the aid they give is tied to projects. They like to do projects, and they will quite often, you know, like dams. I mean, some of these some of these projects are useful, but they will they they don't have sort of comprehensive aid things where they say what can we do to you know reduce infant mortality in west africa or something they say you know there's a road or a dam and we'll build it and they will you know on the one hand they, they get a lot of respect in africa for the fact that they will send laborers there or you know workers there who are prepared to work under local conditions which sort of western expatriates are never prepared to do um and they get kudos for you know being prepared to invest quite a lot of money in africa um on the other hand, they also encounter a great deal of suspicion um, for, you know, for some of the same reasons that Western companies have uh, encountered suspicion, the idea that they're there to um, grab hold of as many natural resources as possible um, and to bribe the politicians who are giving them the rights to them. And certainly, you know, there are problems along those lines. The uh, Chinese president's son, for example, is involved in something quite dodgy in Angola. Um, the details of which are very hard to make out, but which looks very fishy. Um, and there is also, you know, the problem that, well, is it a problem? Yeah, it's a problem. That, I mean, Chinese, Chinese firms will not operate under the same uh, ethical constraints that um, Western firms do. You know, a, a Western oil company will find it very hard to uh, do business with, say, um, the guys carrying out the genocide in Darfur because the the blowback in terms of reputational damage, you know, I mean, if, would, would be colossal. Whereas Chinese firms don't care. You know, there's not going to be any blowback at all in China. Nobody in China cares about this. Um, and even if they did care about it, they wouldn't be allowed to demonstrate. So um, it's, it's um, you know, I think overall Chinese investment, Chinese involvement there is useful. You know, they're providing a lot of, um, low-cost goods and they're uh, providing, you know, some manufacturing know-how and quite a lot of money um, and they're building infrastructure and these things are useful. But, I mean, it's not... I, 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 don't, I don't think that um, African governments, I don't think African countries are going to be able to copy the Chinese model for growth because the Chinese model for growth relies on having been an appallingly repressive dictatorship um, under Mao Zedong and then sort of taking the boot off um, off people's heads and allowing you know an entrepreneurial culture which had existed before to come out of repression um, you know Africa hadn't really had it before they'd had a trading culture um, but you know only really I mean, nothing like as sophisticated as the Chinese had. So it's much more sort of starting from scratch. 
gentleman in the check shirt. Thank you. I'm uh, Robbie Green. I go to William and Mary. And I was wondering, uh, what do you think about the idea of establishing um, regional financial exchanges in Africa? I know that's been a suggestion by the IMF, like financial exchanges that are across countries. The African Union has also, you know, kind of suggested that. Sounds like a good idea to me. I mean, you know, the 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 the, the essence of an exchange is you've got to. You know, you've got to have enough scale that it that it works, and you've got to have the sort of institutional probity. It's got to be sort of clean. Um, but yeah, there's, there's not nearly enough exchange going on. There's not nearly enough cross-border exchange. I mean, there's a lot of barriers to trade between African countries. They're actually higher than they are between you know African countries and the rest of the world. Um, and you know, there's 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 a lot to be said for it. Um, it's quite a lot to be said for common currencies between African countries as well. I mean, I would have thought that the whole of Southern Africa should be operating on the RAND. Um, you know, there's parts of West Africa that are effectively pegged to the euro. Um, East Africa's ripe for the same thing. I mean, you know, it, it, it's partly because that would ease trade and partly because um, it removes uh, discretion from uh, not very competent national governments over the um, currency, which too many of them wish to manipulate. But um, yes, I think it's a good idea. Yes, sir. Um, Zachary Brigg from UC Berkeley. Uh, I don't know how we haven't really gotten to it, but in your opinion, what should Western policy be to promote growth and stability in these African countries, maybe on like a general level? I'm sure it's... Okay. Um, I mean, the, the, the instant answer is it's not actually the responsibility of Western governments to run Africa. Um, you know, the responsibility can only come from within. Um, on the other hand, uh, it is possible to help at the edges. I think that um, aid policy should be... Um, not, not predicated on a long list of, you know, you've got to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, et cetera, um, or we won't aid you. It should be based on a sort of overall assessment of is this, is this government doing roughly the right things? Is it, you know, moving in the right direction? And if so, um, then we'll help them. And if not, we'll cut them off without a penny. Um, and generally, um, Western governments are incredibly slow to pull the plug. I mean, they were about 15 years too slow to pull the plug on Robert Mugabe. It was staggering. I mean, you know, very early on in his time in office, he massacred 20,000 people in Matabili land, and everyone in the West was like, mm, what's going on? I mean, they just didn't even notice. Um, and um, so, uh, he, he, but although that can help a little bit, and, you know, there's work by people like uh, David Dollar and Lant Pritchett, um, that suggests that um, aid to uh, countries with sort of, you know, reasonably competent institutions um, and relatively low levels of corruption can um, accelerate growth. I don't, I, you know, I really don't think it's the determining factor. I think that, you know, it has to come from within. Yes, sir. Maybe one than the other. Um, in light of the better governance in Africa and increased transparency, and then <clears throat> also recently um, a McKinsey report citing the high growth rates in Africa, would you still consider it a shackled continent? Well, I mean, the, the I choose my titles carefully. Um, the point about shackles is that they can be removed, you know, and... Maybe you go from having shackles on both your arms, your legs, your neck, um, and you're down to just one round your ankles. Um, the McKinsey report you're referring to, um, you know, it, it, it highlighted um, some reasonably high growth countries and some impressive companies. Is that the one you're referring to? Now, those, those companies are indeed impressive. It is noticeable that they almost all come from South Africa um, with, you know, a couple from 
Egypt, a couple from Algeria, something like or Morocco or something. I mean, it was, it was, there's not a very wide geographical spread of world-beating companies from Africa. Um, there's, there's a number of really, really good ones from, from South Africa and then a sort of uh, a Petro Bank from um, Angola, I think. Um, what, what, what really necessary... Um, I mean, South Africa has, you know, a sophisticated economy and then a whole bunch of people who aren't really linked up to that within South Africa. The rest of Africa, you know, they, they're, they're really at a sort of lower level than that. And um, it's extremely hard to get anything other than sort of family businesses operating in somewhere like Congo. I mean, the kind of place where you have strangers working together, um, operating on, you know, written rules um it's, it's it's just not there yet people don't trust each other enough because the law is not enforced as a way of you know um making sure that written contracts are adhered to um the law is considered by the government to be a tool that the government uses to shut down opposition to the government um and so you you know you have to you have to get the rule of law first before you can have you know institutional companies that outlive their founders you can have, you know, a, a sort of trading family guy company that depends on the one guy being in charge, but it's very hard to get, you know, something like a, an Anglo-American or a, a De Beers or a, you know, um, Standard Bank um, from from places other than um, South Africa and the, the, the Arabized countries to the north. Um, so I think there's a long way to go, but you know, there, there are certainly... I mean, if what McKinsey's saying is there are investment opportunities there, that's undoubtedly true because most people are so scared of putting money into Africa that the returns on investment are very high there because that's the risk premium that, that people expect. So there's, you know, there are fantastic opportunities there, undoubtedly. Well, final so. question. Final. Really? Yeah, hi. Um, there have been a number of articles about, like, African countries getting plugged into high-speed internet and things like the $100 laptop. Mm. And... Those articles seem, seem to suggest this is really sort of game-changing and it's going to be, make a huge difference. I was wondering what sort of value you assign to that side of sort of the technology growth or if maybe that's something that comes... I, I, I think those things are very important. I mean, you know, it's not a substitute for not being imprisoned by your government for, for, for protesting in the streets, but um, you can use... I mean, mo mobile phones are, are the really big one. Um, mobile phones are fantastic because they... They, they did a sort of leapfrog thing. You know, the African governments didn't see them coming. They had uh, landlines in many countries were a government monopoly, so they're completely useless uh, companies that would take two years to um, fix a, a line in your home and, um, you know, and the line wouldn't work or the guy at the national phone company would rent your line out to somebody else at night so you get this huge bill at the end of the month because somebody's been using your line to call... Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, hundreds of people in, in, in Britain or America or whatever. Um, and then mobile phones come in and, 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 they're, and they're done with sort of prepaid cards so people would never get a bill that um, they couldn't pay. Um, and, and they worked because the technology was all off the shelf. And suddenly people are able to communicate with each other um, you know, farmers can, can call somewhere that's sort of three days walk away to find out, you know, what the prices are for various products so they can actually get their, their goods there and sell them. Um, and this, this sort of raises, you know, rural incomes massively and it helps people get to where the work is. Um, and it's also become a, a, a sort of um, a shadow banking system. I mean, if you're a, a sort of, um, you know, uh, a peasant or a member of the urban poor, you can't, you know, you can't get a bank account, you can't get a credit card, you can't get a debit card. But then suddenly people discovered, hey, you know, these, these mobile phones, they have units um, of, you know, for airtime. And we can use that as a currency. And actually, it's a more reliable currency than many of the fiat currencies issued by the government. It certainly doesn't inflate the way the Zimbabwe dollar or the Angolan Kwanzaa does. Um, and so they started using them as payment systems. And this, I think this started in Zambia. And it's a fantastic thing. You can go into a shop and you can say, I want this. And then you just zap you know, the, 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 the mobile phone will send some credits to um, the, 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 the till um, and you have a sort of cashless um, payment system, a sort of electronic payment system that's just piggybacking on the phones. And it was because there was nothing else there and these companies were able to provide this. I even, I mean, I, I bumped into a woman in um, uh, Congo who used 
Um, she'd been separated from her daughter by the war, which I didn't get into, but um, the Civil War there was unbelievably terrible. Anyway, she discovers that her daughter, who she thought was dead, um, was alive in a different part of the country. And um, there were no roads in Congo, really, so she needed a, a, an aeroplane to get um, uh, to be reunited with her mother. And she couldn't get through the airport because the official was demanding a bribe, and the daughter didn't have any money to pay him. Um, so what she did was she sort of texted um, her mother, who then texted back the number of the scratch card that you would use to get more units for your mobile phone, and they were able to give the number of the scratch card to the official who was demanding the bribe, thus giving him $10 worth of credit for his mobile phone. So they were effectively able to do an electronic transfer a 1,000 miles across roadless jungle um, in order to get rid of the official, in order to get the daughter on the plane to be reunited with her mother. Those kind of things, those kind of creative solutions to problems that technology enables are really quite startling to watch. Is it a substitute for good governance? No, but it's a nice compliment to it. Am I allowed one more question, or are you? You've already asked one, haven't you? I'm going to take that. So, well, as a uh, journalist, well, you obviously work for one of the best journalistic uh, publications in the world, in The Economist, and uh, looking at the United States, well, I, I guess that's interpretive, but. Uh, Looking at the United States, we're seeing a lot of newspapers failing and uh, collapsing and maybe a uh, dumbing down of journalistic, not necessarily integrity, but the number of journalists available. How would you probably solve or how, how do you think we should solve that problem in the United States or may go about increasing okay. media integrity? Okay. Um, well, here's a question for you all. How many people in this room with your own money paid for news content in the past week? Oh, yeah, you're a good boy, yep. Um, okay, some of you, that's pretty good. But, I mean, you know, when I was at university, which, alas, was some time ago, everybody bought newspapers. Um, and, and nowadays, young people don't. Um, and yet many of the same people, many of the same young people say they'd really like to go into a career in journalism. And you're like, well, if you're not prepared to pay for it at all, I mean, how do you think you're going to live if nobody does? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem. Um, the, the industry is in, in, in quite big trouble. I think um, nobody quite knew. I mean, the, the Internet is very disruptive technology, very wonderful technology, very disruptive. A lot of people didn't know how to deal with it, thought that the thing to do was to put all your content out there for free um, and hope that advertising would, 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 would make that worthwhile. Um, that turned out not to work. So I think a lot of people are going back to the you got to pay for it um, uh, model. And um, that means that the journalists have to produce copy. and uh, Sorry, they have, to use, they, have to, they have to produce stuff that's actually worth buying. Um, and so I think what you're going to see is a smaller number of papers, some of which are going to be better. Um, and for sort of, you know, mindless gossip about celebrities, I suspect that stuff's going to be free because um, pretty much anybody can do that um, and that, you know, the quality stuff will survive. And, you know, electronics reduces the cost of distribution. So when the day comes, which is probably not very far away, where paper's gone completely and everybody's reading their, their subscriptions to The Economist on an e-reader of, you know, whatever brand is popular in five years' time, um, then, you know, our distribution costs will have fallen to effectively zero. Um, and we'll be able to charge money and things will be delivered instantly. Um, and maybe that's a model that we can survive on. I mean, you know, I, I work for one of the very few organizations that's still really profitable, but we're very paranoid about it because, you know, we see what happened to other people. But I think, um, I mean, we, we did an article quite recently about a number of newspapers around the world that have started to make money by simply being less um, inefficient than they were. It used to be, particularly American papers, you'd have a lot of these local monopolies um, in towns and they would have all the classified advertising for, say, Baltimore or Phoenix or whatever. And they would they were just complete license to print money. And they'd have all these journalists who'd sit there doing nothing. You know, they'd have, you know, half a dozen who'd work really hard. But um, I mean, there was a great story that uh, 
is, is ascribed to uh, Ben Bradley, the former editor of the Washington Post, that he was doing a byline count on the, the, the journalists working for him. And he observed that one of his correspondents for the style section, or whatever they called it in those days, had written precisely two articles in the preceding year. And um, he called the guy in and he said, you know, two articles in a year? He said, you know, for, for the money I'm paying you per, per article, I could have got Norman Mailer to do that. And um, the hack responded, ah, oh, yes, but I don't think Norman Mailer would have covered that harmonica convention in quite the way I did. And um, that's how newspapers used to be run. Um, they will not be run that way in the future. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, there has, to, there has to be demand for quality and it will be delivered if people are prepared to pay for it. So take out two subscriptions. Are we going to have to call it a day there? Well, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>